1998, Disney adapted The Legend of Mulan as an animated adventure. The story of a girl named Mulan who takes the place of her aging father by disguising herself as a man and going into battle is very much a Chinese story told with a Western gaze and clearly a product of the latter days of the Disney Renaissance. Despite this, it had a generally positive reception, but it was less well received or successful in China. Nevertheless, the animated Mulan has plenty of fans, especially amongst those who saw it on its first release, who really connected with Mulan's story of bravery and defying gender and societal expectations. It's perhaps not surprising, given China's growth of the cinematic market, that Disney chose to give Mulan a live action do over. But unfortunately, like many of their remakes, this 2020 version is a hollow facsimile of itself. I've talked before about how Disney's remakes are essentially just an excuse to monetize people's nostalgia, being expensive moralists their own cultural dominance, where they spend huge sums of money recreating the past over something original. Movies like The Lion King or Aladdin are too beloved to be meaningfully changed, and their live-action clones only go to show how inspired and energetic their animated counterparts were. Sadly, these are the remakes that are most successful at the box office, whereas iterations that go in different directions, with the sole exception of the Jungle Book have been met with failure, either critically, commercially, or both. But while I'm definitely not a fan of Disney's creatively bankrupt reheats, I was actually fairly supportive of a remake of Mulan, which would have genuinely benefited from a new take with a different tone and sensibility. The animated film is not perfect by any stretch. Unfortunately, in execution, this 2020 version completely misses the point of the story. The movie puts its foot wrong right from the outset in the pre-title sequence, showing Mulan as a young girl who already shows more aptitude for action because she's full of chi, which is her father, played by Tize Martelza, is more for warriors than it is for daughters. This chi allows this version of Mulan to view the sort of gravity-defying waifu that is commonly associated with Chinese usha films, but it's also a signifier of that very Western genre, one that's successful all around the world, the superhero movie. You see, this version of Mulan isn't like the other girls. Literally, she has superhuman powers. I don't think I've actually heard the word chi used so much in a movie since that time Steven Seagal used it to hadouken someone into a wall, and I'm pretty sure if you took a shot every time someone says chi in the dialogue, you'd end up in the emergency room. This change is arguably the most important because it changes the way that we view Mulan as a character. While much of the early scenes are about her struggling to fit in a world where a woman's place is solely to find a husband, much as in the animation, like the matchmaker scene, in that case, it's less about Mulan's awkwardness and more because she's trying to suppress herself and her abilities. While both versions end in slapstick chaos, only in the live action version does she manage to catch the tea set as it flies through the air with her body, in a moment which recalls the bit in Sam Raimi's Spider Man where he catches Mary Jane and the contents of her lunch tray. The weight of those expectations has far less significance in the remake because the audience already knows what Mulan's true skills are, and also, it doesn't seem Mulan is particularly bothered about fulfilling those traditions anyway. But the chi problem really starts to manifest itself around the time Mulan arrives at the training camp. There's no more, I'll make a man out of you, not just literally because they've taken the songs out, but frankly, Mulan doesn't need it, as she's literally the most gifted, powerful person there. This greatly undermines the story and Mulan's character arc. In the anime film, she has to prove herself to her fellow recruits and earn their respect, which she does by pushing herself harder than any of them through sheer grit and determination because she's so inexperienced. In the remake, the training camp section is greatly extended and becomes boring and interminable because Mulan doesn't actually gain or improve anything from her time there, which kind of defeats the purpose of a training montage. By making her almost divinely gifted, it makes her a much less relatable character Character. We connect with characters through their struggles and empathize with them. That's a big reason why the original Mulan is so blood by girls and young women. They connected with her struggles as an ordinary person and felt empowered by her victories. I doubt the same will be said for the remake, which makes its empowering message much more overt, but feels so much more distant to its target audience. It's at this point the tone of the film also becomes important. Obviously, Mulan 2020 is much more serious-minded than its predecessor, and while many 
fans are furious at the omission of Psychic Mushu from this version, I'm not surprised it was discarded because it really wouldn't have fit the tone of this movie. Eddie Murphy's performance, while amusing, is definitely the most overtly Western element of the animated film, and also it's clearly an attempt to recapture the magic of Robin Williams in Aladdin, something which Disney did repeatedly in their later Renaissance films, even as the comedy undermined their drama. What is missing though is a character that actually connects with Mulan in the same way as a confidant or as a friend. Lao Yifei is incredibly bland as Mulan, lacking any kind of presence in the role whatsoever, but the way the character is written as being so guarded for much of the running time gives her pretty much nothing to play anyway. Mulan's main conflict in the camp scenes is to not expose her identity as a woman, making this the most deadly serious version of just one of the guys I've ever seen. They've also greatly downplayed the love interest with Lai Shang being divided into the characters of Commander Tung and Recruit Shen, but while that romance originally had some perhaps unintentional LGBT subtext, here Chen's affections are so invisible that they're practically platonic. Hey, we gotta get this past the Chinese censors, there's no gay coding here! Tung may confide to Mulan about the time they served with her father, but that's just filler fluff to bulk out the running time and give an underutilized Donnie Yen something to do. They've taken out all this and the songs, but in their place they've substituted it with nothing but sheer spectacle and expense. As you would expect for Disney, this has very high production values and often it looks visually gorgeous, but that's not a substitute for a personality, and Mulan feels hollow. But this super serious tone with few moments of levity and striving to be grounded makes the Usha elements feel jarringly out of place, especially in a second half that's dominated by lengthy battle scenes that quickly become goofy. The film obviously owes a debt to things like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Hero, a debt that's acknowledged by the casting of Jet Li and Donnie Yen in key roles, but with its overcut action, it feels like a Western approximation of an Asian genre that it's not stylish or fanciful enough to pull off. In the film, much of these physics-defying antics are done by the villainous Rorans, who walk up walls and so forth, but of the Imperial Army, it's almost exclusively Mulan who does the same tricks. This has the effect of making the rest of the army look comically weak, but also makes Mulan look ludicrously overpowered. It's not enough that she saves the day, she has to do so effectively single-handedly. Her big moment is after she dies a symbolic death in her male identity, where she reveals her full power in her female identity, by stripping off her armor, untying her hair, and letting the chi flow. She dodges arrows, she kicks spears out of the air whilst riding her horse, and also she glides around the battlefield in magnificent slow motion in such a powerful display that the enemy run away in terror because they think she's a witch. That's quite impressive, considering they have a literal witch on their side. Male or female, this is a terrible way of writing an action hero, because making them someone that cuts through swaths of enemies with ease takes away any tension or drama, and why should we care if there's no sense of danger? Also, this is clearly calculated to be a symbolic embrace of Mulan's femininity and self-identity, but it only cares about Mulan's ability in battle, something which it explicitly coded as a masculine trait earlier. Duh! And what makes this worse is that you've got interviews with director Nikki Caro, who somehow tries to claim that this isn't a superhero story. Mulan is not a superhero. And so we wanted to stay off the wires as much as possible. So she wasn't flying through the air and mostly adhering to the laws of physics. <laughs> You've got to love IGN cutting that quote to clips of the cast doing wire work as if to totally undermine the point she's trying to make. Look, I know you're trying to promote the movie, but you don't have to lie. You effectively made a superhero movie. Just embrace that. After revealing herself to the Imperial Army, we get the moment where Mulan is shunned and disgraced by them, but in this context, where she's done all the hard work and literally saved them all, it comes off as hilariously preposterous. All this talk about dishonor for being a woman comes off as particularly absurd when she's already showed off that she has practically godlike abilities. As far as Mulan is concerned, she might as well be a one-woman army. Who cares if they join her? Her fellow recruits are cardboard cutouts, and when they do join her side for the climax, they all end up getting shut in a big corridor with a bunch of bad guys, leaving Mulan to effectively save the Emperor by herself anyway. The godlike aura of the new Mulan is only amplified by the recurring image of a phoenix 
sidekicks throughout her journey, I guess effectively making it a replacement sidekick, which in case you missed the ultra subtle rebirth subtext earlier, reappears during the climax to fly behind Mulan and open up its wings in a true moment of SUMMERSAM! It doesn't have the same meaning as the infamous Game of Thrones shot, but it's no less as grown worthy. There's something deeply ironic about a supposedly more grounded take on this tale that actually feels more fantastic and cartoonish than the animated film that it's based on, and that had a talking dragon in it. There's also the matter of Gong Li's shape-shifting witch, who works for Jason Scott Lee's Bori Khan, who is Bori by name and boring by nature as far as villains go. I don't know why Hollywood versions of Asian mythology feel need to keep adding shape-shifting witches. Even though it's based on a Japanese legend, 47 Ronin added a virtually identical character in reshoot, but at least Lee provides the most interesting character in the film. She ostensibly serves Khan because supposedly he will build a society that's more tolerant of people like her that are full of chi, which directly links her to Mulan and her story of self-acceptance. We know this because the two characters literally explain each other's motivations to each other in their very first scene in lazy writing, but that's beside the point. Needless to say, Mulan and the Witch have several confrontations, including one where she offers Mulan to join their side at her lowest point. Oh hey, it's another scene that echoes one from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, who would have thought? But of course, Mulan is too noble and selfless to accept because she's fighting for both family and country, in what is obviously the most nationalist pandering moment of a movie clearly aimed at Chinese audiences. Over the course of the movie, Mulan manages to win over the witch instead, to the point where she betrays Khan and pays the price for it, having to sacrifice her life in order to save Mulan's. On paper, this redemption is solid, but in execution it's painfully rushed, where this evil but sympathetic villain has a sudden last minute face turn and there's no clear sense of her overall motivations. But Lee's witch is not only substantially more engaging than the actual main villain, and more powerful, which undermines him as a threat, but she's more engaging than Mulan herself is. There's a reason why Lee is the most distinctive part of this movie. She's the only person that has an arc in it. Is Mulan the worst of the Disney remakes? Not even close. Not when something as soulless as The Lion King exists. It does have some ambition, which actually makes it even more disappointing that it falls so far short. It's not only inferior to the animated film, but it doesn't work on its own terms because it tells the story so poorly, integrating elements of various genres that actually undermine the message that it's trying to convey. Like a lot of the Disney remakes, it feels corporately minded and plastic, and instead of inspiring a new generation to be whatever they want to be through inner strength and courage, it instead sends out the message that there are superheroes and everyone else. If you like this video, then you can support my work over at my Patreon, where you can see my videos early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.